Hello, everyone. Welcome to this press conference on Access Now's latest report, Defending Peaceful Assembly and Association in the Digital Age, Takedowns, Shutdowns, and Surveillance. My name is Carolina Beringer. I am a summer policy intern at Access Now, and I'm honored to moderate this press conference and to join you today along with Laura O'Brien, our UN Advocacy Officer, and Peter Meisek, our General Counsel and UN Policy Manager, who both led Access Now's report. Well, throughout 2020, we have been seeing a rising tide of protests worldwide that are sparking discussions on the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic shed light on the impact of technology on both the protection and the restriction of such rights. Earlier this week, Access Now published its first report focused exclusively on the intersection of technologies and the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. Uh, for this press conference, I will first give the floor to Laura and Peter, who will introduce themselves and then expand on the content of the report. And after their initial remarks, I will be posing them some questions. So if you have any questions, please send them in the chat and I will address them to Laura and Peter. Thank you all for joining us today. And Laura, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Carolina. And thank you, everyone, for joining this session. So we'll kick off uh, the discussion today by providing an overview of our report. As I'm sure many of you have been attending RightsCon online sessions, you haven't had the opportunity to read a 50 page paper with over 200 footnotes. Um, and on that note, I would like to also, if you haven't checked it out already, we do have a much more digestible five page summary of the report, which really distills you know, the key case studies, key takeaways and recommendations. Um, and as uh, Carolina mentioned, I'll then hand it off to my colleague, Peter Meisek, who will then focus in on some of the case studies of protests worldwide, highlighting both the power and also the fragility of those exercising their right to freedom of pe peaceful assembly and association in the digital age. We'll then conclude by answering your, your questions. So as our executive director, Brett Solomon, announced during opening ceremonies, we're very pleased to launch this report, which was co-authored by myself and Peter. So what led us to write this report? Why did we decide to write this report now? There are two motivating factors, one which is probably very obvious to you all, um, but let's go into the first one, which is a little less obvious. We at Access Now haven't previously had a dedicated thematic focus to freedom of association and assembly, but we were quickly noting a pattern in our work that this topic is really very much intersected in all that we do. So for instance, the Digital Security Helpline um, provides 24 seven direct technical assistance to a lot of different groups, including activists and human rights defenders. We also have our Keep It On Coalition, which is over 220 organizations from 99 countries around the world. And in their, their latest Keep It On report from 2019, we documented that the most commonly observed cause of internet shutdowns were protests. So it was really this intersection of our work that was juxtaposed against this current global context that we're in right now. You know, the rise of internet shutdowns worldwide, the prevalence of unlawful surveillance, increases in privatization where we're seeing tech companies focusing solely on the profit motive instead of their users. And then finally, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the topic for us really moved away from this area of interest um, and this pattern to become a necessary priority um, for us to hone in on this topic and contribute to the discussion from this digital perspective by offering insights from our current campaigns and our initiatives. And the current global context really presents this um, set of guiding questions of signposts that can guide us through the discussion on these rights. Where have we come from, particularly since Arab Spring? Where are we currently noting the momentum of the Black Lives Matters protests, both within and beyond US borders? And finally, where are we heading with the impact of COVID-19? So in answering these questions, the paper contains three separate chapters and includes a series of recommendations at the end for states, for private sector, and for international institutions. So for right now, I'll go briefly into explaining the three chapters and highlight some of the key aspects. So the first chapter was access, connectivity, and internet shutdowns. And when we're speaking of internet connectivity, it's not just about access to the internet. We're talking about access to open, secure, 
affordable and a stable internet connection, which is fundamental to, for the enjoyment of various human rights. And yet time and time again, we see governments around the world that are impairing the exercise of these rights, including freedom of peaceful assembly and association by imposing internet shutdowns, such as this year's government mandated one in Ethiopia, for instance, that are in violation of international human rights standards. And 3.6 billion people worldwide lack access to the internet. And this is concerning when we consider from an international human rights perspective, the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 9C, which calls on least developed countries to bring everyone online by 2020. Well, it's 2020 and we are in the middle of a pandemic where access to internet is vital to save lives. So now more than ever, there's a need to mobilize this political will to accel accelerate SDG targets because the world is well behind and we will miss this well-intentioned target. And we can't forget also the various digital divides that exist along the lines of race, gender, disability. And it's not just an economic fix, although noting we need to consider economic, social, and cultural rights here, but we need to address the systemic barriers at play. The second chapter goes into unlawful surveillance and the right to privacy. We all know that privacy and anonymity provides activists and protesters with some level of assurance that they will not be identified, identified or subject to reprisals for engaging in their protests. However, the use of surveillance technology to monitor individuals and their activities both online and off, such as during the protests in Hong Kong and, and India in 2019, triggers this fear of identification and persecution. And it also creates a chilling effect, not only on freedom of assembly, but also those intersecting rights such as freedom of expression. So this chapter goes in and highlights um, some of the uses such as IMSI catchers, hacking social media accounts, spyware being used, um, to also assessing how mandatory SIM card registration and digital ID programs are collecting data, including biometric data, um, and how that's impairing these rights. We also go a bit into the discriminatory impacts on particular groups, um, specifically regarding facial recognition technology. And then finally, the last chapter focuses on the influence of the private sector and online civic space. You know, we time and time again, we've heard at all these rights concessions that tech companies hold extreme power over spaces where these individuals are exercising their rights, including the right to protest. And in light of this power, states often pressure tech companies to disrupt internet access, remove content, or, or hand in users' data as part of strategies to hinder individuals' rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and expression. And transparency is reporting is essential to monitor tech companies' activities and for demand accountability. I'd like to note on this, this topic in particular, myself and many of my colleagues at Access Now, we were very moved by the fireside chat discussion earlier today with the president of Color for Change, posing thought-provoking questions regarding these platforms and their responsibility. And it really reminded me of this one quote that we have in the paper, which is thinking how we can rethink the role of these platforms and these companies when they take credit for supporting popular uprisings around the world, you have no accountability to their users and the regulation of speech. And, and the fireside chat also rightfully noted that it's not just about accountability, more must be done. So with that being said, these are the three chapters. I'll, I'll hand it off now to my colleague, Peter, to, to highlight more of the case studies and examples. Thanks, Laura. Um, I would love to jump into some of the recommendations and case studies. I uh, just want to emphasize a few things at the start that really uh, underlie the uh, thinking behind the paper and uh, our contribution to the development of this right at this time. And that um, those are three. First up, this right applies online. Uh, you'll see this reflected in the new general comment issued by the Human Rights Committee on uh, the rights of peaceful assembly and asso association. This right applies online as offline. And um, as we all know, during the COVID um, epidemic and this social distancing, we are left in a place where in order to connect with one another, in order to do our work and maintain our livelihoods, and of course, to participate in collective action, uh, we must use information and communication technologies, ICTs, um, and we rely on the internet. 
so this, rely, um, this right also applies online as offline, uh, including to remote participation uh, and digital assemblies. Uh, this right also applies during crises. Just because there is a, a crisis does not negate our fundamental rights. Um, the crisis could be a pandemic like COVID. It could be a political crisis um, like demonstrations. And that's one of the case studies in our paper looks at um, the crisis currently in Ethiopia following the assassination of the uh, charismatic musician and leader um, Hakalu Hundesa. And uh, the protests and demonstrations that took place there uh, did see violence erupt um, with hundreds killed. Unfortunately, the response from the government was uh, to clamp down on the spread of information. Uh, information saves lives during pandemics. It saves lives during violent protests. And uh, it saves lives you know, when you know, people can't access emergency services. And uh, we see this response of shutting down the internet uh, as um, wholly disproportionate and unnecessary and actually unhelpful even during crises. Uh, thirdly, this right is fundamental. This right can't be abridged unless um, done so in an environment that is, uh, that is clear, that is open, that is showing that it's necessary in a democratic society to interfere with the right, that its um, interference is proportionate and uh, pursuant to law. And so we apply these, these principles when looking at these case studies. Um, so in addition to looking at internet shutdowns like we saw in Ethiopia, uh, we looked across the world to Hong Kong where you know, the world has been inspired by this youth led movement over the past few years, especially um, where youth are innovating in ways that are really necessary to protect themselves, their bodies and their rights. Um, they're innovating to combat increasing uh, police use of technology in order to surveil, in order to uh, and stoke fear in the populace and chilling effects that would negatively impact the collective right to protest. Uh, and so what they're doing is um, responding in ways to the police use of technology like facial recognition technology uh, and uh, covering their faces and, and their bodies. Uh, to prevent identification, to uphold their right to anonymity, which is essential to uh, their safe and free and open exercise of this fundamental right to collective action. Uh, in Hong Kong, we've seen a series of laws that have been passed in order to strike at this right of uh, anonymity of anonymous uh, um, contribution to and participation in public protests and uh, most recently striking at the rule of law itself, um, allowing warrantless surveillance and um, harassment of protesters as we've seen in the past few days. Uh, so this right is under attack uh, online as it is offline in places like Ethiopia, Hong Kong, and then taking it home to uh, the United States where I am located, uh, we have a case study looking at the aftermath of the George Floyd murder at the hands of US police forces that has re-inspired the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, we've seen it gain momentum over the past couple months. And it in turn has been met by um, unlawful and overbearing police surveillance that makes use of all sorts of digital technologies and tools. Uh, the story is still being written on all three of these case studies uh, as, as surveillance works. It's meant to be kept hidden and secret. And so often we only learn uh, much later what actually uh, law enforcement authorities and states were up to and what the private sector was, was helping them to, uh, to affect, um, what sorts of measures uh, the state used um, through procurement of tools and services from the private sector. And in the United States over the last few months, uh, there have been some revelations of uh, police circumventing, for instance, warrant requirements by um, buying data from private providers uh, like data miner. Police have uh, procured, uh, sorry, not just police, but um, federal authorities, including uh, Customs and Border Protection, um, part of the Department of Homeland Security have procured 
services and devices like drones um, um, for one purpose and then repurpose them in order to monitor and surveil peaceful protesters uh, engaged in legitimate exercise of their human rights and constitutional rights. And uh, so it, this public-private partnership is something that we think merits um, extra attention. Uh, so the third chapter of our, of our report deals with uh, the privatization of a lot of the spaces and channels, uh, tools and services that we depend on to exercise our right of peaceful assembly in the digital age and provides recommendations to the private sector, but also to international institutions and states on how to uh, interact with uh, the private sector in ways that respect fundamental rights and ensure um, anti-corruption, anti-discrimination, uh, pro-competition, and um, civilian oversight through transparency and accountability. So yeah, the recommendations run through um, the case studies and build on them in order to uh, direct states, private sector entities, and international institutions on how to best respect and protect this right in the digital age. Uh, one last piece I uh, wanted to point to was um, that, as, as we may mention, the paper largely focuses on the right to peaceful assembly, uh, looking at protests and demonstrations, you know, whether spontaneous or organized, uh, but it also does speak a bit to our right to associate. Um, and I think one place that we saw this right uh, most uh, directly distilled and put at risk in the past year was the proposed sale of control over the .org domain space uh, to a private equity firm with no history and no background of, uh, of running such an important global entity. Um, the .org space Access Now uses along with you know, the YMCA and Wikipedia and all other sorts of um, public interest organizations and entities um, activists and advocates. Um, and uh, this space was directly put at risk by this, you know, fairly shady deal uh, for more than a billion dollars uh, that was, you know, announced as if it were um, already packaged and sold without any consultation with those directly affected uh, in civil society and beyond. And so uh, the world uh, uh, quickly mobilized uh, in our community and far beyond to hashtag save.org and uh, this case study makes it in, and I think it uh, recognizes that um, our right to associate also applies online and uh, increasingly depends on uh, open and online spaces uh, that hopefully can be protected in the public interest uh, and with human rights uh, by design. Thanks. Thank you both for the overview and the examples. They certainly shed light on the importance and the challenges surrounding uh, peaceful assembly and association nowadays. Uh, moving on to the questions, as Peter illustrated, uh, technologies provide governments and companies with a variety of tools to undermine the right to protest by facilitating monitoring, identification, intimidation, and persecution of protesters. Uh, when facing these kinds of repressive policy strategies, what are the tools protesters uh, can use to protect themselves and to circumvent these harmful uses of technology? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've seen it being discussed uh, a lot during the RightsCon online sessions. And, and there's two that come to mind. So the first in terms of um, when we're talking about internet shutdowns, you know, the circumvention tool of virtual private net networks, VPNs, um, mentioned on a session yesterday, actually, on connecting using other platforms through their country's domain uh, to be able to communicate in the face of an internet shutdown, while noting the fact, again, about, you know, wanting access to affordable internet. Um, affordability is definitely an issue in that. In terms of surveillance, different circumvention tools, you know, we're, we're really seeing a lot of discussions on end-to-end -end encryption using tools available such as WhatsApp and Signal um, so that they can limit direct access, access to metadata. And we're routinely seeing these cited in sessions. And I think an important thing to note here is to really ensure that there's the training, the education and empowerment um, to accessing this information and, and continuously um, reusing these tools. And I think one um, uh, case study I wanna highlight that really you know, was impressive in how they organized around this was the protesters in Hong Kong. 
Um, we saw that they were communicating only via secure messaging apps at one point in time, deleting conversations related to the protests and using the prepaid SIM cards uh, not linked to their personal information. Uh, so I think those certain strategies are, are very helpful. Yeah, I would uh, add that, you know, in addition to the tools and services that uh, protesters use, but not just protesters, anyone really who wants to um, reduce their digital footprint and, um, you know, keep confidential and uh, safe uh, their personal information, but also that of their community members. In addition to these tools and services, you know, we should think of the legal infrastructure and, and the regulatory infrastructure as also uh, protecting our our right to engage in peaceful assembly and uh, everything from data protection laws, which you know should reduce the amount of information that um, private sector companies can amass and also share with or even sell to um, public sector entities. Data protection laws have a role. Of course, surveillance reform, ensuring uh, civilian oversight and you know, warrant requirements. Um, we refer to the 13 necessary and proportionate principles applying international human rights law to communication surveillance as important. Um, and uh, so data protection laws, surveillance rules, um, as well as uh, protections on, of course, uh, speech and uh, the content of our communications. Great, these are very helpful uh, inputs. And you mentioned, uh, Peter, the regulatory framework that we need to be in place to protect assemblies. And I would like to move on to a more institutional framework. Uh, the report puts forward recommendations to international institutions and throughout RightsCon, we have been hearing from these different special rapporteurs uh, on how they are inter integrating discussions on the digital age uh, into their mandates. Could you uh, elaborate on your views on the importance of the engagement of international organizations and especially UN special procedures mandate holders in advancing the respect for the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association in the digital age. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as Laura can attest, I think there's uh, been excellent work done recently, um, uh, first and foremost, by the, the mandate holder on uh, uh, the rights of peaceful assembly and of association, which we can speak to. Um, I mentioned the human rights committees uh, and that's a, the only official body that interprets the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, uh, that Human Rights Committee did finally put out a new interpretation of, of this right uh, in uh, its general comment 37, uh, which just came out uh, this week. And uh, so there's, yeah, I think long overdue development of um, this right, uh, but, you know, it's, it's really on the work of, you know, this, this special rapporteur Volet and others who are showing that this right not only applies in the digital age, but it takes all sorts of forms that we may not have expected. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really on our community to, to show the really creative and innovative ways that uh, people are, you know, defying a lot of the restrictions and joining together, even if it's not, you know, what we usually think of as a uh, you know, big picket with uh, signs in front of uh, Congress. Yeah, and I just want to highlight also just the importance of the UN Special Rapporteur is really joining together, you know, when they issue a joint statement, when they're doing those, these coalitions and, and recognizing the intersection of digital technologies within their mandate and also the intersection of all these rights together, it's really powerful. And so I think having more of that, um, so that we can use that in our advocacy um, is really beneficial to moving this forward. Yeah, uh, just a quick uh, reminder. So if you have, if the audience has uh, any questions for Laura or Peter, just put them in the, sh in the chat and I'll address them to them. And meanwhile, um, in a related note to what we are discussing now, uh, the report contextualizes the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association in the broader international human rights framework. And we've been uh, seeing engagements, engagement from special rapporteurs, for example, and OHCHR in this topic. Um, why did you choose to analyze this topic from the human rights lens? Uh, 
I think Peter was mentioning that briefly in, in one of the answers, but really we're looking at it from this lens um, in terms of, you know, a lot was happening at the UN level. We saw, you know, the general comment number 37 just came out today. OHCHR had released a report that was assessing digital technologies um, and the right to protest, uh, all the Human Rights Council resolutions on civic space, on um, the right to protest, and also uh, intersecting rights such as freedom of expression. Um, so we really wanted to provide an overview of this and update it um, for really for advocacy, um, noting that if doing an assessment on on this issue, you know, having just the international level um, wouldn't be a, a good sole focus. So we did want to highlight those domestic case studies and also regional perspectives as well um, in order to ensure that people have a, a full picture of, of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would add that, you know, we've seen um, and we've, we've worked closely with partners from and um, based in the global south who uh, particularly note that um, this right is is broadly respected and affirmed in all sorts of uh, regional and national instruments. And so uh, approaching this uh, from a, a human rights perspective and standpoint is is really key to show that um, this right applies globally. I think it makes even more sense in the digital age when it's so easy uh, to form associations and uh, to assemble across borders using these tools. And uh, again, it's something that hasn't been um, quite so developed and, and I guess in a good sense, maybe not quite as politicized as the right to freedom of expression, for example. Great. Uh, and now bringing the discussion to uh, the health crisis that we are going through currently, as you mentioned in the report, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's changing the way we interact with society, uh, as well as the way we exercise our rights. Uh, and this includes the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association, as the traditional forms of physical uh, social gatherings are no longer possible. Uh, how do you see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the exercise and the protection of freedom of peaceful assembly in the long term, if any? I think, I mean, I think yeah, anyone can answer that. It's, it's, really, um, it's really happening before our eyes and you know, beneath our fingertips. Um, yeah, I, I hope that in the long run, this, uh, this redoubles and there's some evidence that it has redoubled the attention to connectivity, to access to affordable information and communications technologies, that's devices, services, uh, but also, of course, the literacy and uh, the, the culturally relevant um, content and services that, that are available to us. And uh, there's really one need, and that's for funding uh, to bring the next, you know, three and a half billion, four billion online in a meaningful way. And uh, that is something that I don't think anyone could ignore is a necessity uh, in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, will, will become no less important uh, as we move forward. Laura, sorry, do you wanna add something? Uh, no, I think Peter summarized it quite well. Um, just to add that, you know, you know as reiterated in the paper, you know, the aftermath that we have with COVID, um, it's going to have a triple effect. And I think going back to, you know, SDG 9C, I think that was um, kind of one of the main things that we were pushing is to really mobilize this political will uh, around internet access, particularly in, in COVID. Uh, we are approaching the end of this press conference. And I have one final question to each of you for your closing remarks. Uh, first, Peter, what do you, what do we need to work on to advance the respect uh, for the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association in the digital age? Uh, what are the pressing challenges right now? Thank you. Um, as as I mentioned, I think uh, internet access into into the home, not just into the workplaces and the schools and the public plazas that we have you know, made some progress on, but um, really meaningful broadband access to the home that's uh, not discriminated, that's um, respecting that neutrality, and uh, that is endowed through, you know, really affordable services. Um, that's, that's key. Uh, you know, once we have that, I think 
you know, uh, well, certainly we can't wait until that comes about, but um, I think uh, looking much more deeply at the relationship between the state and the private sector uh, with respect to this right is key. As we make it a, the point in the report that um, Facebook really has an outsized influence, whether it's through its um, WhatsApp groups, uh, you know, which I think we're all probably uh, a part of, uh, as well as um, Instagram, but uh, of course, Facebook's groups and, and pages, which number in the millions or uh, hundreds of millions. Um, that is that is a um, massive uh, driver um, of this right in the digital age. It's also a place where, you know, as we've heard quite clearly over the last few days, uh, people suffer uh, undue discrimination uh, and arbitrary and you know, really blatant restrictions um, that don't comport with international human rights law. So uh, it's, it's looking at um, the exercise of this right on private platforms um, and then you know, trying to ferret out the relationship between states um, uh, and, those, and those private platforms and then other act, private actors in uh, advancing respect for this right. Great. And now, so we can leave on a more positive note, uh, Laura, what do you see as hopeful in the current or future scenarios of freedom of peaceful assembly and of association in the digital age? Thanks, Carolina. This is a great question and I think really speaks to what was uh, being discussed at Boulay's um, web webinar um, earlier this week. And I think, you know, really what's been happening is, you know, these movements have been very powerful and there's been a lot of positivity that's come out of this. You know, for instance, the, the UN Human Rights Council resolution uh, that led to led by the African group, you know, judicial decisions against internet shutdowns in Indonesia and at ECOWAS. Um, and laws on police use of surveillance tech as enacted by the New York City Council. Um, so I think, you know, there is really a lot of hope and momentum and, and just really to encourage people to, to keep exercising their rights and, and forms of solidarity. I think, you know, it keeps us on a positive note to, to push forward and make the systemic change. Great, we have a lot of work ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Laura and Peter for leading on this extremely relevant and necessary report. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the days ahead of RightsCon. Thank you. Thank you.